Good evening. I hope you're all fine and healthy. Just a few quick announcements. Uh, the UCAT is available on our website. Um, the details of the website and the worksheet will be put in the description of the video, so keep an eye out. A few announcements of the worksheet on how you put in your information. Remove apostrophes from your name or your surname. For example, if your name is if your surname is D'Souza, D is followed by an apostrophe. Just take it out, like the example on the screen. Do not add any hyphens or numbers or commas in your name. That's going to make it really tedious for us to send you back your worksheets. And uh, maybe you won't get your worksheets at, uh, as soon as it was intended to be given to you. And finally, just write your name and surname only. No middle names and nothing fancy. Just your name and your surname. That's it. Uh, that's all. Uh, have a great session. Thank you. Let us begin today's class with a prayer in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Kindly repeat this prayer after me. Lord Jesus Christ, who before ascending into heaven, did promise to send the Holy Spirit to finish your work in the souls of your apostles and disciples. Deign to grant the same Holy Spirit to me that I may perfect in my soul the work of your grace and your love. Grant me the spirit of wisdom that I may despise the perishable things of this world and aspire only after things that are eternal. Spirit of understanding to enlighten my mind with the light of your divine truth. Spirit of counsel that I may ever choose the surest way of pleasing God and gaining heaven. Spirit of fortitude, that I may bear my cross with you and that I may overcome with courage all the obstacles that oppose my salvation. Spirit of knowledge, that I may know God and know myself and grow perfect in the science of the saints. Spirit of piety, that I may find the service of God sweet and amiable. And spirit of fear, that I may be filled with a loving reverence towards God and may dread any way to displease Him. Mark me, dear Lord, with the sign of your true disciples and animate me in all things with your spirit. Amen. Okay, students, as we begin today's class, let me first wish you all a very happy feast. And may Saint Anne and Saint Joachim bless you abundantly. I would like to wish your parents too a very happy parents' day. And may God bless them too. And students, do not forget to wish your grandparents as the feast of St. Anne and Joachim is a patron feast of the grandparents. So, please, without fail, okay? I'm literally asking if your spare grandparents are not staying with you, just one call that will make them really happy and they will appreciate that now, let me begin today's class by what we did last class. I will just revise a bit. Now, last class, what did we do? Hmm. Okay, next slide. Let's see. Yes, we did parables. Now, what did I say about parables? What are parables? Hope you remember. Next slide. Parables are short stories with spiritual lessons. They help us build relationship with God and with our neighbor. Now, you, who used these parables? Yes, Jesus used parables. 
But why did he use parables? Let's see in the next slide. Now, why did Jesus use parables? Now, parables teach us how to live under God's rule in the world today. In relationship to God, in relationship to our neighbor. What Jesus effectively tells us that as a Christian, your life must be reflected in word and in deed. Yes, my dear students, he is asking you that your life should be reflected in what you do and what you speak. You, if you imitate, like I told you in the last class, if you imitate Jesus, surely you will reflect him. Every action of yours will be his reflection. And no longer people will see you, but Jesus living in you. And I'm sure Jesus also will be glad to see you imitating him. Now, these parables, they help us grow in relationship, not only with God, but our neighbor too. Let's go to the next slide. In this slide, we see that parables help us to build a strong communion not only with God, but with the neighbor. That means it comes under this others. In others, you have friends, neighbors, relatives, family, everybody comes under others. And then with your own self too. And with nature too. Now you may think, why I have to build my communication with nature? What has nature got to do with my spiritual life? Now, students, actually, God speaks to us through nature too. I'm not saying this, but St. Paul tells us that God talks to our, all his people through the creation which he has made. You can read Romans chapter 1 verse 20 onwards and find out what God is telling through his creation. If only we would have respected the nature and not interfered in God's creation, then today we would not be facing the natural calamity that is COVID-19. Because it is said God forgives. We do forgive sometimes, but nature does not forgive. But we have to fear. You know why? Because we have our dear Jesus with us. With Jesus with us, he can crush the COVID-19. COVID-19 virus is nothing for him. He is a victorious God and he can just crush it. So do not fear COVID-19. Now, next. In the last class, I also spoke, I told you about parables that there are nearly 50 to 60 parables to this. And now these 50 to 60 parables are grouped, are classified into four groups. Now let's go to the next slide. Here. This I showed you last class also students. And I want you to note this. Please keep your notebooks open. And whatever I'm asking you to note down, please note it as it will help you in making your journal. Not only that, it will help you in your worksheet too. Now, the first one is the coming and growth of the kingdom. Students, I'm dictating, you can note it down. The coming and growth of the kingdom. The second, the challenge to action. Or in other words, you can say parables of judgment. The next, the kingdom as opportunity of salvation to all. And the last but not the least, parables of warning. Now, these are the four groups. Now, last class we already did the coming and growth of the kingdom. Now, today I'm going to do 
the second group that is the challenge to action next slide yes these are the parables now the parables which are we going to do under the challenge to action that is the parables of judgment now before that let us see what is the meaning of challenge to action if you don't know the meaning of this we will not understand the parables at all next slide okay now here is the meaning of challenge to action in this parables we hear jesus is called to action after warning his hearers that they are in great peril of refusing god's invitation he now challenges them to action now after people have listened to him they are yet not changing their ways now god is say, uh, jesus is saying if you are refusing god's invitation and challenging you please take an action today don't sit on the fence he's telling the people who are sitting on the fence do not sit on the fence either you jump on or you get off play do do not play safe or take sides don't be in two sides don't be diplomatic that is what jesus is calling you to do and now the first parable and under this group we do is next slide yes now i want you to note this down the parable of the weeds and the wheat matthew chapter 24 Verses twenty six to thirty. Uh, this is a uh, sorry, students. It is Matthew chapter thirteen, not twenty four. Have you noted down? Okay. Now I'll narrate the parable to you. Now. just as jesus was addressing to the crowd he says the kingdom of heaven is like this a man sowed good seed in the field one night when everyone was asleep an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away when the plants grew and the heads of grain began to fall then the weeds showed up the man servant came to him and said sir it was good seed you sowed in your field where did the weeds come from it was some enemy who did this he answered do you want us to go and pull up the weeds they asked him no he answered because as you gather the weeds you might pull up some of the wheat along with them let the wheat and the weeds both grow together until harvest then i will tell the harvest workers to pull up the weeds first tie them in bundles and burn them and then gather in the wheat and put it in my barn this is the parable that jesus narrated to the people now have you understood the message that jesus wants to convey to us now i'll give you a simple simple example if you have not understood this i'll give you a very simple example you know that is have you visited a wholesale fruit market one we have in baikala and one is in mawashi now do you find loads of baskets filled with apples mangoes and other fruits the baskets here are opened and the fruit merchant peeps into them if he spies a rotten apple or mango what will he do 
What will you do? Empty the basket. Feed out the rotten apples. And then put the other good apples into the basket ready for sale. Why does he remove the rotten ones? Ask yourself and you, would you buy rotten fruits? Rotten vegetables? Jesus too would not like us to get spiritually rotten. It is left to you what you want to be. Choice is yours. Whether you want to be wheat or you want to be wheat, choice is completely yours. Let us go to the next parable. Sorry, the next slide. Now you will see the significance of the parable. Now, the deeper meaning of this parable, what does Jesus want us to understand by this parable? Now, let us read this slide. One thing he wants us to know is that God alone can separate wheat from wheat. We cannot do this. So, it is God alone can separate wheat from wheat. Now, just as among the good seed plants, wheat began to sprout. So also among the good people of God, we find many not so good or bad people. What are we tempted to do with them? Are we quick to sort them out? Like we weed out the rotten apples from the basket of good apples? The process of separating is the task which God alone can do. We simply cannot do it. God will separate in his own time, allowing opportunities for people to become mature, that is holy, at their own pace. Yes, at your own pace. Here, yeah, that fable, slow and steady wins the race. Slowly, you can change. The transformation will be slow and steady. Now, let's see. go to the next slide. Number two, what do we learn? The putting labels on people, this is very easy for us to do, students. How easily we put labels on people? She is lazy. He is selfish. They like to show off. These neighbors of ours are tail carriers. We tend to judge people without evidence and sometimes we cause them much harm in this parable, Jesus shows us that we humans are unable to know the inner motives, that is the thoughts and feelings of people. And therefore, we have no right to label them for life. Only God sees the motives of our behavior. Only God is able to make allowances for our so-called bad behavior. Through this parable, we learn one more thing, students, that is, now, wheat will symbolize is the good people. Now, these good people will inherit the kingdom of heaven. And the weeds, bad people, so they will not be able to inherit the kingdom of heaven. No, choice is yours. You want to be wheat or you want to be wheat? You want the kingdom of God or you do not want the kingdom of God? Now, in this parable, we learned three basic lessons. Three basic lessons. And I would want you to note it down. I will dictate. Note it down. Number one, it is only God who can judge and separate the good from bad. We can never, Sema 2, we can never judge people's behavior as we do not understand their motives. And last but not the least, we are called for repentance. We are called for repentance. Are you ready? Next slide. No, you. 
Jesus is calling us to repent because for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's very close to us students. And if we don't repent, we will not inherit it. And I'm sure each and every one would like to inherit this kingdom. Each and every one would love Jesus to be part of their lives. The Lord of Harvest extends a standing invitation to all of us to repent before the day of the final separation or the last judgment day. Are you ready to accept the invitation or reject the invitation? Would you like to be the wheat or the wheat? Once again, choice is yours, but act now before it is too late. Next slide. Yes, earlier Jesus is telling you to act now. This is your last chance. Live the kingdom life today. God's kingdom life today is asking us to live today. He's giving us a fair deal. Are we ready to accept? And uh, students, if we reject, then really we'll have to be sorry all our lives. It will be good if we accept Jesus in our life. I will tell you one simple example. Now just imagine uh, your SSC board results were out, okay? And you got good percentage. Now you're seeking admission in St. Xavier's College and they have called you at 11.30. You have to reach St. Xavier's at 11.30. And you are not that good traveler by train. Now only you have started maybe. So you ask your mom, how do I go? Mom says, go by train. And then she tells you also the timing. So you say, fine, 10 o'clock train I'll get. I'll go from the last station to church. You go. Now, when you reach the platform, it is one minute past 10. And the train is just about to leave the platform. And what do you do? You run to catch that train. But yet you miss it. It's gone. That one chance is gone of yours. But you don't go home. Do you say, forget it. Let me go home and sleep. No. Because your admission is important for you. So you wait for the next train. Next year train also comes. But as it is packed, you're unable to climb in. You wait for the third train. You don't go home. You don't give up. Because that is very important according to you. Because you need admission. And in St. Saviors, they may reject you if you don't reach there in time. And the third train is nice and empty. You relax, you get in, and you, you reach your destination. Will you spend so much time for Jesus? Will you give this preference to Jesus? How important that admission was for you. Jesus is also waiting that way. He's waiting with his arms open. That when will my child come to me? He's just waiting one step. You take just one step, go one step forward and Jesus will take two steps forward. He'll come to embrace you. Yes, students. So he's asking you to act now. Just as the admission is important, your spiritual life is also important. Once you gain Jesus in your life, you have Jesus in your life, everything will follow. These earthly things automatically, they will fall in place. Your success, everything with Jesus with you. But sir, if Jesus is not there with you, then sorry to say, I don't know how much you will be successful. But that is my experience. With Jesus, 101% success will be yours. Now, student, after Jesus narrated this parable of the weeds and the wheat, the crowds left. And after the crowds had left, his apostles were a bit 
confused about this parable. They did not understand. See, the apostles also did not understand the meaning of that parable. Then they asked him, Master, what was the meaning? What did you try to say in that parable? Next, this is what Jesus said. In Matthew chapter 13, next slide. In Matthew chapter 13, verses 31 to 38. Please note down this, students. The man who sowed the good seed is the son of man. And that is Jesus, our loving God. And Jesus says, the field is the world. This whole world that God has created is the field. And the good seed are the people of the kingdom of God. The weeds are the people of the evil one. They are the evil one. And you can also call Satan. Okay, evil one is Satan people. Now, let us go to the next parable. Next slide. Yes, the parable of the barren fig tree. Now, with this, now I want everybody to note down this, the name of the parable as well as the quotation. Matthew, Gospel of Matthew, chapter 24, verses 32 to 35. Have you all noted? Now, let's go to the next slide. Let us see what does this parable say. Say, yes, now hear how Jesus narrates the parable. Then he told this parable, a man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard and he went to look for fruit on it, but did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard for three years now, I have been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? But our loving, loving gardener, that is none other than Jesus is saying, so let it alone for one more year until I dig around it and put manure on it. See, Jesus is taking our responsibility, our responsibility of being fruitful. God may be sad. I created such beautiful people and they are all disobeying me. But Jesus is saying, no father, wait, I will change them. And do you want to disappoint a loving Jesus who is pleading to God? I don't think that will be fair to the students to disappoint Jesus. Next slide. Now, why the fig tree, not the mango tree or the apple tree or any other fruit tree? Now, fig trees were an important and common source of food for the Jews in Palestine. They were grown in vineyards. And since water was a scarce resource, it was important that the tree be fruitful. A fig tree does not bear fruit right away. The wait is three years before the tree can bear fruit. The, now remember this, a point to be noted, students. The fig tree does not bear fruit right away. You have to wait for three years. And only then you can eat the fruit of that tree. Next slide. Now, fruit trees require a lot of care to continue producing luscious fruit. It is not easy. It is not an easy task. It's rewarding to see a tree bending under the weight of apples, pears, oranges, or grapefruit. To go into your backyard and pick your own fruit you watch develop and ripen is both instructive and rewarding. 
Now, mostly if you see in villages, students, if your house are in villages, if you have gone there, maybe to the south side, Kerala, or even Goa, you have fruit trees in the backyard. Now, if you have planted a tree, imagine you have planted a tree, and when you go there after two, three years, you find a lot of fruits on that tree. The tree is just full of mangoes that you had planted. Won't you feel happy? How happy you would be and you would just jump to eat the mangoes of the tree and you would really love to eat the mangoes of that tree that you planted. One more thing, your parents, when you get the result of 80, 90%, won't they feel happy and proud? Similar way, Jesus also will be proud if we be fruitful, will be happy if we are fruitful. And imagine if you are not fruitful, okay? If you don't bring good percentage, surely your parents will feel sad. Don't you think even Jesus will feel sad if we are not fruitful? Yes, he will. And he lives with us day and night with us, watching over us. And he wants us to be good, good and being fruitful. Next slide. Now, there are some difficulty here. In the vineyards where vines and fig trees grow side by side, the fig tree absorbs a lot more water. In case it did not give fruit, it would be chopped immediately. But if it did, its fruit was much more valued, fetched at higher price. Imagine children, students, you get a big price and then what is the problem and i want you to note this problem as per the leviticus laws in the first three years the fig tree grows you have to let it be without taking fruit fourth year onwards you must harvest the fruit see what does the leviticus law says that for three years you have to allow the fig tree to grow and only then in the fourth year, you can harvest, or in other words, you can eat the fruit of that tree. Now, next. Now, in the case of this particular fig tree, which Jesus is speaking, it is six years, double the time. The owner is getting impatient therefore commands to chop it off here the gardener makes an unusual request to manure the place something unheard of in those times in those times you wouldn't hear this thing about manuring and all that and but the gardener says this because who is this gardener none other than jesus it shows the Passion and mercy of God is always with the people. This parable, what is we learn from this parable is that God's compassion and mercy is with us. Who would, who would repent and turn away from their bad deeds? This mercy is there with us. But when? When we turn away from our bad deeds, when we inherit his kingdom, when we go towards him, when we embrace Jesus as our savior, as our guide, as our teacher, as our everything. Next slide. Now, the unproductive fig tree, that is Luke. See here the right, you see. Luke, it is uh, 13, 6 to 9. The symbol used, the fig tree, symbolizes the people. Gardener symbolizes Jesus who pleads to the owner and that owner is God Almighty Father, Abba Father. Now let's go to the next slide. Here. Now the parable of the barren fig tree offers us two news. One is good news and one is bad news. And what is the good news? Let us see the good news. 
God is merciful and willing to forgive. And the bad news is, God's mercy has its limits. Now, it's better we repent while we have the opportunity. If the time is gone from our hand, we cannot even repent. Next slide. Now here, the comparison is between the compassion and the objectionable behavior of the people who run after the futile and the false. We are like in a mad race, running after something which is perishable, not of this kingdom, but yes, we want it. More and more money and clothes and this and that, whatever, all that, We're running after that. But what is God wanting? The only fruit you can bear is repentance. If you repent, you will be justified. Otherwise, not. The next slide. Now, before he takes it away from us, to give it to someone more worthy, transform your faith into action. Live the kingdom life today. Who is telling us this? Gospel of Matthew, chapter 21, verse 43. What does it say? Therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. If you do not bear fruit, you remain barren. I will wait, 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 wait. But there will come a time when I will give this kingdom to somebody else. So this is the right time, students, that we repent. We repent and say sorry to Jesus, our master, our savior, so that we inherit the kingdom of heaven. Next slide. Now, this fig tree, the barren fig tree, also symbolizes every individual who remains unrepentant. So here I've written Israel, it's not only the people of Israel, huh? in the people of Israel, even we, we too come uh, in this. Now, would you like to remain unrepentant? I'm sure not. You would love to repent. So repent and believe in Jesus. Next slide. Now, the fig tree in today's world, the barren fig tree portrays us, the Christians in today's world. Have we, as Christians, borne the fruit of our faith? How big is our faith? How small? As a mustard seed, Jesus said. Even if our faith is as small as the mustard seed, it will grow like the mustard plant. So, my dear students, if your faith in Jesus, your trust is in Jesus, is as small as the mustard seed also is more than enough because Jesus is confident that that faith, that mustard seed faith in you will surely grow. He has confidence in you. Do you have confidence in Jesus our Savior? Now this fig tree, the whole fig tree symbolizes us. And there you have God, the owner, and Jesus as the gardener. Now, students, just imagine. After your board exams, when you get your results, okay? Because so some of you must be really studying very hard now. Some may take it very easy. They will really take it very easy. It's their time. Prelim ka one month will be the January. I'll study that time. Okay, you do that. Okay, you do that. And in the end, you get less percentage. You regret for that. You regret if only I would have studied, I would have got so much, so much percentage. I did not study and so I did not get that percentage. Your career depends on that students. And what you have done, that chance, that one chance that was given to you, you failed it. Maybe you have not failed the class, but you got less percentage. And no more chances then. Then no more chances. Yes, there is that. There is a chance. If you give re-exam again, but what? You waste one year. 
and Jesus is giving chances after chances to grow in your spiritual life. So grow in your spiritual life. Be fruitful. Next slide. This is the parable of the Pharisee and the publican. Please note it down. Now, it's chapter Luke chapter 18, verses 9 to 14. Now, you know a Pharisee who is a Pharisee, right? And the publican, also you call them a tax collector. Now, Jesus is speaking about these two people. A Pharisee and a publican, a tax collector. See, the prayers. How does a Pharisee pray? How does a tax collector pray? Now, if you see this image, see how the Pharisee is praying. Where is he looking? Up to God. He's looking direct into the eyes of God. And he feels maybe he's the best. And now see that uh, tax collector. Where are his eyes? To the ground. That is his humility. That is what Jesus wants from us. Next slide. Let us see the parable. Now, the parable takes place at Israel's most holy site, the temple. Thus, two visitors are on opposite ends of the social spectrum. The Pharisee is a respected religious member in a most honored social group, while a tax collector belongs to one of the most hated professions possible for a Jew. Now the two prayers also make a contrast. Now we'll see the two different types of prayers. Now I would like you to note down the prayers. Huh, students, next slide. Now see what this Pharisee is trying to say. The Pharisee is sure that he is a blessing to God. He is a blessing to God. Huh? Now here's what he thought. Now this prayer, I want you to note it down. What is his prayer? I thank you that I am not like other men. He's judging them. Robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. See, what is his prayer? I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. I am the best. I am who I am, according to him. There's nobody like him. He is the best person here on earth. Next slide. Now, you will see clearly God's program could hardly advance without this man. That means the Pharisee's contribution to whom? To God. His program would be incomplete without Pharisee's co contribution. It seems like that by that Pharisee's prayers. It starts out like a thanksgiving psalm in which God is praised for something he has done, the Pharisee has done. But the form is perverted since the occasion of thanksgiving is what the man that is a Pharisee has done for God. Now here, he's trusting is his own self. He's overconfident, he's proud. He's boasting. He's a show off. He's not a humble man. Now, do you think Jesus will like this prayer? If you say a prayer like this Pharisee, will that prayer be accepted to God? How about Jesus? Students, can you tell me? Was he proud? If I, frankly, if I would be daughter, like that time, if I would be son of God, surely I would be proud. You know why? Because I am who I am. I'm son of God. But no, Jesus was not at all proud. You have to learn a lesson from his living. He was such an humble person. What he could not do, what do you think he wouldn't be able to do? If he had to give those uh, Romans, he would have beaten those Romans. What not he could do? But no, for what purpose did he come? He was such an humble man. If you be even one-fourth, 25% of what Jesus is, you have won the battle, students. Yes, 
even that 25% life for Jesus, life, I'm not even talking of 50%. Yes, you have to live 10% like Jesus. You are called for that. But I'm just saying, even that much as a mustard seed, that much you have of Jesus in you, think you have won the battle. Next slide. And now, his real prayer is, God, I thank you that I am so marvelous. In his own hum humble eyes, he is not unrighteous. Now, God needs to do nothing for him. He makes no request to God. He offers no honor to God. This religious man has done it all. He has done everything. God has not done anything for him. Now, students, after reading his prayer, we wonder whether God should apply to be his assistant. Yes or no? Okay, come on. Let's go to the next slide. Now, here is the prayer of the tax collector. Now, let us see how the tax collector is. In contrast, the tax collector senses that he approaches a holy God, a great and unique being. For him, God is unique being. He's great, he's mighty. This man comes with timidity from a distance, not lifting his eyes to heaven. The tax collector knows he is a sinner. Yes, student, he knows that he is a sinner. He has sinned. He accepts that. Are you willing to accept that you are ready to repent? That you are a sinner? Each one of us, I'm not talking about you, even I am a sinner. And when in my prayer, I tell God, Lord, I'm a sinner. Have mercy on me. That will be a beautiful prayer. Next slide. Here, see. Your prayer should always begin with, have mercy on me, a sinner. You cannot say at all, student, that you have not sinned. Small, small things, in small, small ways, you disobey God. And always be humble in your prayer. The tax collector asks for mercy. He desires to improve his spiritual health, not rest on any personal laurels. He's not overconfident. I have done this, I have done that. No. He's humble. He accepts he's a sinner. And he wants to be good. He wants to change. Next slide. Now here you see God's kingdom upside down. Why was only one justified and the other not? When Jesus evaluates the two prayers, only one petitioner went home justified. The tax collector's prayer honored God and was heard. Not that of the Pharisee. The parable's point is summarized in this saying, the tax collector has a humble heart. He is honored by God. See, now he is honored by God. God is giving him honor. God is accepting his sacrifice, his prayer. Since this prayer is an example story, the call is to be like the tax collector, receiving childlike faith. Children are called to be innocent. They don't have a you know, they don't understand too much. For them, what their parents do is right the same way. You may remove some faults in your parents, but if when you are a child, you must have not removed a single fault in your parent. Similar way, a childlike faith. God wants a childlike faith. Fully trusting, like how you trust a, a small child trust in the parents, he wants you to have that same faith in him. Trusting in Jesus completely surrendering your life into his hands. Next slide. Now Jesus says, act now, before it is too late. He's saying, act now, take necessary action. This is high time. 
act now. Let nothing impede you. Neither riches nor pleasures of this world, nor responsibilities of life. Keep them all aside and come follow me, he said. Act now is supremely worth it. And yes, it is worth it. Act now. This is your last chance. You will not get a chance again. So he's asking you to act right now. Are you willing? Are you willing to act now? Are you willing to surrender your lives completely into the hands of Jesus? Next slide. Now, these three stories from everyday life, they call to repent. These three stories use three parables. Now, to change the direction of one's life. Through these parables, Jesus wants us to change our direction of life. The life that we are living is all materialistic. So he is telling, telling us to change the direction of our life. Events happen in this world over which we have no control. And sometimes good people just like you and me make mistakes and lose our focus. Just as while driving, if we do not focus, what happens? We meet with an accident. So, if we don't focus, our focus is not on God, not on Jesus, what will happen? You will meet with a spiritual accident. You will be spiritually dead. You know, every day we hear news reports of accidents, natural catastrophes, and attacks that take innocent life. So, as it is with our spiritual life, we need to grow in our spiritual life. Sometimes our spiritual life is going down and we need to boost up our spiritual life. And to boost up our spiritual life is a right way, what you know? Word of God. Read the word of God. Don't feel lazy. Give some time. Okay, you can begin with just 10 minutes. I told you, don't want to read the Old Testament. Don't read. Read the Gospel of Luke. Just read right now only the parables. Try to understand the hidden meaning in those, in those parables and see what a change you will be, students. And that change is required, not only for yourself, for your family, for our parish and for the country also. Okay. Now, let us... The next slide. Now, the sword of the spirit is the first piece of armor that is both offensive and defensive. We are protected when we use the sword as Jesus did in his temptation in the wilderness. The word of God spoken in faith is our sword and defeats the enemy every time. Victory is ours. For this, we need to read, understand, and memorize the word of God that is the Bible. So let us now, this very moment, make the Bible as a sword against all the temptations of this life. Judas. You to close your eyes. Just close your eyes. Don't get distracted. Everybody, close your eyes. And I want you to okay. breathe in Jesus. Breathe out Jesus. Breathe in Jesus. Breathe out Jesus. 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 Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Relax, students. Please do not open your eyes. Just listen to the words. The words I speak. A reading according to the Gospel of St. Matthew. He answered, An enemy has done this. The slave said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, No, 
for in gathering the weeds, you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, collect the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned. But gather the wheat into my barn. Yes, he is asking that he would tell his reapers to burn the weeds and put the wheat in his palms. Now, let us reflect on this word of God that I just read. What do you feel? Don't you feel Jesus is so gentle with the wheat and also with the weeds? He doesn't want to hurt them. He allows both to grow together in the field. Judge for yourself. Are you the weed or the wheat? If Jesus stops near the wheat, what do you think would he say to them? If he stops near the weeds, what would he say to them? Try to hear him, students. By now you know Jesus better and you know what will he say to you. If Jesus were to come and stop near you, would he consider you a wheat or a weed? Why do you think so? Answer yourself. And then, why do you think so? Then talk to Jesus about your feelings on being considered by him wheat or wheat. Ask him, Lord, what do you consider me? If you consider me wheat, then help me to grow. Pray to him. Talk to him also about how easily you consider other people like weeds. Say sorry to Jesus for the times you have failed him. Surrender yourself completely into his hands and tell him that you want to inherit his kingdom and to make you like him. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The students, you will get only 30 minutes to complete the worksheet because it's very simple and I'm sure you are going to answer your worksheet well. Good evening. Thank you, children.